Uh, good morning, and I'd just like to say a quick thank you uh, to Monica, the faculty, and um, her staff for organizing what I think is an exceptional and timely symposium. If we are to believe the photographs that grace the covers of travel magazines and that pop up on tourism sites throughout the web, then Africa is verdant jungles, herds of darting animals, liquid sunsets, totems, mud huts, and rural, rural peoples. But Africa also is also the blaring horns of trotros and molus packed with urban denizens inching along the clogged ghost flows of Cairo, Kinshasa, and Casablanca. Africa is the seemingly endless slums whose magma of rusting roofs seep between the postmodern high rises of telecommunication companies that together with the mirrored boxes of global banking concerns puncture the hazy skylines of Abidjan, Accra, and Joburg. Africa is home to legions of urban actors who negotiate their daily lives through the rapid fire transactions on SMS, cell phones, and, in the, and lobbed in the sprawling markets of Lagos, Freetown, Nairobi, and Kampala. Contrary to our collective Western imagination of safaris and savannas, the future of Africa is urbanizing. As recent UN uh, habitat statistics reveal, close to half the population uh, on the African continent lives in urban areas. These diverse cities are experiencing rapid unbridled growth. This, the steady crawl of its periphery into the hinterlands that once buffered but now absorbs rural villages is expected to make Lagos, for instance, the world's second biggest megalopolis by 2030. Africa is developing an ethic of dissent. In the words of curator and cultural theorists Okwe and Weezer, a backlash against the unrelenting pressures of modernization and modernity. Emerging urban formations are upsetting the spatio-temporal frameworks impelled by long-standing expectations of Western progress. In total, the contemporary African city has often been characterized from Nweezer's perspective as chaotic and disorderly, and therefore always outside the category of order and modern urban planning and procedures of rational spatial organization. He has challenged prevailing theories and methods of urban analysis in the social sciences, especially planning uh, in his research and his curatorial projects. His larger critique argues that the studies of cities such as Lagos, Freetown, Joburg, and Kinshasa, each with its own unique past, social histories, and spatial contours, has always been predicated on the imposition of binaries of order and chaos and the temporal spatial comparisons of the colony and metropole, the first and third worlds. Nevertheless, as the works of artists on the continent and its diaspora, as the urban landscapes of South African photographer Santu Mof Mofuke King chronicles, these long-standing hierarchies of here and there have been short-circuited in the wake of transnational mass migrations, the time-space recalibrations of global capital and new technologies, and the weakening of post-colonial governments by internal fracturing and the external assault of neoliberal policies. Africa is, to quote urban theorist Abdul Malik Simone, an impossible location from which to anticipate a future. Simone further suggests that for many, home is constructed across a variety of sites, networks, and compositions. As a result, urban Africa increasingly intersects with a growing number of cities external to the region and with more heterogeneous complexes of urban politics, labor markets, and cultural expressions. If understood as a kind of provisional urbanism, then Simone has detected what he calls ephemeral forms of social collaboration that are creating new forms of governance, new forms of mobility, and new cultural spheres. Understanding these evolving modes of social engagement and social spaces, however makeshift they may be, could offer, I want to contend, new models for how to build in African cities. This may allow for urban interventions that might incrementally transform and be transformed by the everyday lives of Africa's urban actors who, among many problems, lack adequate housing, safe drinking water, and reliable transportation. Episodic, I want us to consider, in light of these new social forms and challenges, in what ways can architects think about, imagine, and design a visionary urban future and a radical future architecture for the African city? 
Can new urban imaginaries, how groups of people create relationships and understandings of past and futures that are not governed by formal institutions, but that are exponential, experimental, and democratic in nature, become architectural? As a draft response to these queries, I will present the work of a graduate design studio, Urban Future, Future Architectures, that speculates on some of these latent possibilities. Africa's oldest cities, Cairo, for instance, are built atop the sediment of ancient, of ancient settlements dating back to early Egyptian civilizations. By contrast, newer cities like Joburg emerged from the violent colonial partitioning of the continent set into motion by the Berlin Conference of 1884. We must keep in mind that for over 500 years, Africa's vast resources have attracted waves of Western colonialists, foreign governments, and private companies eager to extract its resources and harbor, harbor, harness its labor to fuel Europe and the New World's in, engines of industrialization. Once arrived, European powers built efficiently planned colonial towns to govern the region and facilitate the extraction and distribution of their spoils. This network of ports, castles, waterways, trade routes, railroads, highways, and pipelines transferred raw materials, peoples, and finished goods from the various regions of Africa to the rest of the world and eventually back. Today, urbanization has layered new routes and structures onto these older systems to create some of the world's largest urban agglomerations. The continued importance of these hubs for channeling the flows of minerals, commodities, and capital has boosted the rapid expansion, has boosted this rapid expansion. In regards to the latter, foreign investment in Africa, according to recent UN estimates, currently outpaces aid and is nearing $110 billion. Finland's Nokia, South Africa's MTN, and of course the ubiquitous Google, are busily planning the next generation of new media devices and services for the vast untapped market. In the wake of 2008's worldwide food crises, agribusinesses in, based in Europe, India, and the Middle East began scouring parts of Central Africa for fertile and suitable land to grow vegetables, grains, flowers, and rice. These enterprises, backed by the fathomless bank accounts of hedge funds and sovereign wealth funds, have not only purchased vast tracts of land, one estimate by the NGO Grain, um, by the NGO Grain suggests that the, uh, the, acquisition, the acquisition of 125 million acres over the past three years. But they have also locked down access to equally valuable water resources. In a tragically ironic turn, Ethiopia, where large parts of its population continually suffer from acute hunger, um, uh, acute hunger now hosts acres of computer-controlled greenhouses capable of growing several tons of food a day for export. In particular, China, a principal investor, has aggressively been brokering deals with African governments. Grants from the Chinese government underwrite the construction of the African Union's new conference center in Addis Ababa. Chinese representatives have negotiated trade pacts, laid new rail and roadways, erected new buildings, towns, dams, um, in exchange for access to oil, mineral, land, and markets. These transactions raise new concerns about environmental degradation, workers' rights, and the exacerbation of long-standing regional conflicts. Pablo Woods, whose photographs we're seeing, uh, has christened this uneven alliance, China-Africa. While the U.S. gazes west for chi towards China, the Chinese and others look south toward Africa. And so the quest to extract the continent's valuable resources continues. While this influx of capital is diverted to the fat pockets of corrupt elites, the newfound wealth rarely trickles down into the institutions that structure urban life for millions in the cities um, and those living in the urban hinterlands and rural areas. Uh, the pressure to enter the wage labor market in order to afford consumer goods have fractured rural families who become increasingly dependent on um, remittances forwarded by members dispatched to urban centers, often unmonitored by government bureaus. I think on the whole, uh, Simone's compelling research and that of others reveal that the daily activities of urban actors depend upon a suturing of informal and formal networks, networks that operate locally through social formations and sync to global flows of capital and goods and transnational movements of people. 
At the core of Inweezer's critical curatorial and scholarly project, the make-do ethos animates everyday life, and therefore the work of artists in these milieus capture the oscillation between collective exuberance and personal exhaustion. Threading through these artistic constructs and expressions, we witness the ways that people are imagining future cities and possible, impossible urbanisms. Urban Futures Future Architectures Africa is a graduate advanced design studio that I taught in the fall at Columbia uh, that researched how urbanization is transforming two of Africa's largest cities, Joburg and Lagos. For the first half of the semester, the studio tracked the various movements of resources into and, and out of and around each city. We talked to uh, geographers, planners, um, uh, we, somebody from UN Habitat. We also spoke with uh, uh, cultural anthropologists working in both of those cities. This cohort, many of whom were keenly aware of their own trajectories as students, workers, and foreigners, were remarkably resourceful in their method. They, uh, they, they analyzed the hybridized beats of Nigerian music as they split and deflected views of Lagos's urban landscape. They combed through reports and documents from corporations, from uh, old mining uh, histories of Johannesburg. And one group actually constructed an urban ethnography in true Nigerian fashion by appropriating Kulha's documentary, Lagos Wide and Close, and getting their hands on the um, unpublished manuscript of Lagos, how it worked. For the studio as a whole, the term city essentially served as a means to bracket the domain of the sprawling megalopolis in its far-reaching tentacles, a conurbation that clearly exceeded local, regional, and national boundaries. By understanding these ephemeral forms of social collaboration emerging in the markets, parks, dance hall, streets, megachurches, and dwellings, the studio's projects tapped into these dynamic spheres to propose future architectures, architectural interventions that recognize the contingent nature of urban relations. One group worked in Johannesburg, the other group worked in Lagos. They looked at places like Ponte Tower in uh, Johannesburg. Uh, one student developed a uh, cellular educational network system operating from the headquarters, the park, all the way down to the flash drive. Um, uh, another group of students worked in Lagos. Uh, they um, revitalized, essentially, and um, transformed the uh, perennially congested um, Oshodi market. And another student looked at the Makoko slums and essentially listened to the sounds reverberating across its sort of murky, um, uh, its, its kind of murky infrastructures and proposed a recording, uh, a sustainable performance and recording center on the lagoon and drew essentially from the history of the radical communal politics of Nigerian, um, uh, Nigerian music, particularly coming from Fela Kutu's African Shrine. In closing, the speculative work of the studio suggests that there may be other tactics to address the challenges of Africa's cities besides or even in concert with the rationalization of urban systems. Perhaps one method might be to recalibrate, reuse, and reclaim what is already there. Another might be to open dialogue with the budding ephemeral forms of social collaboration. Whatever the means, we will have to be imaginative as well as resourceful in our architectural and urban propositions, not just in African cities, but in other emerging urbanisms elsewhere in the world. Thank you.